emails were coming in, so curiously, yeah, we moved uh, to this larger venue, and we certainly thank you very much for that. This is the second program that we've done like this, and I'm wondering how many of you attended our program on those three? Oh, okay, great. So a number of you, and you know at that time, uh, you asked for more, and we actually have been sending out some surveys as well to ask people what they might be interested in. If they were comfortably holding this kind of program again, we got a very, very positive response. So that's why we're here. We also have a very brief survey for you to read, and you can hand that off to one of the staff. That would be wonderful as well. And really, again, it's just get some input from the new way you would like uh, to hear. I also want to particularly call out Jonathan on my staff for all the way that we're doing this together. We're working with great folks on the outside. Okay, great. Uh, I know why you're here. I think that we are all extremely unsettled by current events. So today we really have a chance to listen to local experts, to ask questions, and importantly to learn. I know that right now much of the conversation about this topic is focused on presidents, Trump, and Putin's personal relationship. But there also are some other very important issues below the surface. And so this is an opportunity for dialogue between local experts here, and we're delighted to have them, neighbors and other interested citizens. So I'm going to introduce uh, our moderator and the panelists. We have a very special guest, a friend of mine here, to moderate this discussion, Dr. Susan Shirk. While Dr. Shirk is known as a preeminent scholar from China, she also brings a great understanding of the region to this conversation. As you know, China and Russia are major players in the international community and have many things in common. Dr. Shirk is a research professor and chair of the 21st Century China Center at UCSD's School of Global Policy and Strategy. She is one of the most influential experts working on U.S.-China relations and Chinese politics. And she previously served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State from 97 to 2000, responsible for U.S. policies for China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Mongolia. And she founded and continues to lead the Northeast Asia Cooperation Dialogue and unofficial forum for discussions of security issues. Our first panelist is Dr. Mikhail Alexi. Dr. Alexi is an internationally recognized authority on post-Soviet Russia. Dr. Alexi, he is a member of the Carnegie MacArthur Sponsored Program on New Approaches to Russian Security, that was Polonar's Eurasia based at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. He is currently a professor here at San Diego State University in the Political Science Department and teaches a course on international relations and other subjects. Our next speaker is Dr. Eric Gardsky. Dr. Gardsky's primary area of study involves the impact of information and institutions on war and peace. His research focuses on leaders and how what they know or believe is a key determinant of how nations behave and interact. He is also a professor in the political science department at the University of California, San Diego. And our final speaker is Dr. Philip Roeder. Dr. Roeder is a specialist on the politics of the Soviet successor states. His research focuses on Eurasian political cases but includes global comparisons in his analyses. Dr. Roeder is the author of Where Nation States Come From, Institutional Change in the Age of Nationalism, and Red Senate, Sunset, The Failure of Soviet Politics. And what I wanted to, to share with you on a personal note is an experience of mine that has a connection to San Diego and certainly to this subject. In 1989, as a member of the San Diego School Board, I was asked to accompany San Diego high school students on an ongoing exchange with students in Moscow that had begun several years prior. Students stayed with families for three weeks, and what we know is that it's a student exchange, and what was an amazing experience for them and had been for the last few years. And again,
again, there's different groups of students that put one of the social science classes. I went with a teacher, her name is Marina, and her family, including her in-laws, which was not easy for her, and even for me, um, and got to, <laughs> to walk a bit in her shoes. I saw the resilience in the face of obstacles, particularly around food shortages, and the magic experience of searching small, sterile shops for something as simple as sour cream, only to find, after waiting in line for hours, that the cupboard was empty. There were no typical, even small grocery stores in those days, let alone the supermarket. People hoarded toothpaste and other basic supplies. Well, fast forward two years to 91, another group of students, I go with them, traveled to the Soviet Union for their exchange, and toward the end of their stay, the failed coup occurred, and essentially, they returned to San Diego from the Russian Federation. So with that very brief context, I'm delighted to turn the program over to our experts to explore historical events and the daily news unfolding, unfolding before our eyes daily, as well as the human and really the personal side of the U.S.-Russian relationship that we do not typically hear. Thank you again for your presence here today, for your enthusiasm, and I'm very delighted to turn the program over to our moderator, Dr. Susan Scherf. Well, good morning. Uh, it's obvious that there is a tremendous interest in the question of U.S.-Russia relations and what uh, does Russia want, what, not just what does Vladimir Putin want, but what does, do the Russian people want, and what is the nature of our relationship to Russia. Uh, there probably are a few other folks in the audience who remember, as I do, when Russia was the Soviet Union, and uh, we were having drills to go under our desks because of the threat, uh, the possible threat of a Russian nuclear attack on the United States. So there was great fear and hostility between the Soviet Union, which of course included Russia and a number of other now independent countries, um, uh, toward the Soviet Union and in the Soviet Union towards the United States. And that had a lot to do with the fact that Russia, the Soviet Union, was ruled by a communist party. Uh, after the fall of communism uh, in the Soviet Union, that was a momentous historic event. And we were all quite excited about the triumph of democracy. And uh, we had great hopes and saw, in fact, signs in Russia of moving toward a market economy rather than central planning and introduction of elections. We had Gorbachev leaders like Mikhail Gorbachev and, and uh, Boris Yeltsin who articulated a reform agenda, both economic and political. Um, but now we find a Russia that, while it has elections, has many features of an authoritarian government, and is ruled by a leader who appears personally hostile to the United States. So this is kind of confusing. How did this happen? And what is the actual nature of the Russian threat to the United States? And how did we get here? Was it our fault? Did we pursue the wrong policies? Were we wrong to expand NATO, for example, in a way that made Russia feel threatened? Um, or is it really the nature of some traditional attitude on the part of Russians and Russian leaders uh, toward Europe and toward the United States? So, um, and how much of a threat is it? What is the nature of the threat? Is it primarily a military 
threat? How, what is the nature of the cyber threat and the information threat to America? So these are really difficult and very confusing uh, questions and hopefully I'm confident actually that our, we've got the right panel to help answer some of these questions. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to get us started. Each of our speakers will speak briefly, five minutes, and I'm going to be pretty strict about that. Maybe some, I left my phone in the car, so if somebody could give me a uh, phone. Uh, <laughs> I'm, it, I'm really, I'm, I'm a tough moderator. <laughs> And, um, and then we're going to open it up to questions because we want this to be a conversation. Um, so uh, Professor Alexei will get us started. So I would posit that these are the two motivational things if you want to understand what drives Putin. Uh, the, um, uh, so what is, what is Putin's uh, objective? First of all, is to make Russia very strong, and not just Russia itself, but by also incorporating under Russia's influence pretty much most of the territories of the former Soviet Union. It's called the Eurasian Union idea, and that's why Ukraine has such a little peace, because the conflict over Ukraine emerged when there was a tension between Ukraine going either to the European Union or following Putin's plan to incorporate back into that um, Eurasian Union. It's, it's, it's almost using the formal language of the European Union institution to create that kind of formation, but in essence, if you look at it, uh, it's a way for Russia to exercise the influence, especially in the energy field, to, to reduce the cost uh, of uh, transporting energy and to increase the profits that could then be used to increase Russia's influence in Europe and in Asia through developing uh, na na natural resources and transportation networks, particularly natural gas. Um, EU, in Putin's mind, would be better off dead. Uh, this is one of the maps that was um, met with great applause uh, in the uh, Putin-controlled Russian parliament uh, around 2011, showing the ideal uh, of Europe, uh, what Europe should look like for Russia. So you have Europe basically no longer united, uh, but split between the red countries that are Russia's uh, friends and then the blue ones that are enemies. 
uh, other ones being neutral, and Ukraine being split into three. Uh, the Ukrainian Republic of the Russian Union, and then uh, the annexed part of Ukraine, which is mostly Donbass and Crimea, and the proper Ukraine just remain there tucked away in the West. Uh, NATO too, uh, better uh, without it, uh, from Putin's standpoint. And finally, even the United States. Uh, the more the United States is splintered, fissured, undermined, the better uh, for Russia. So that the United States can be preoccupied as much as possible with its own internal divisions uh, and rivalries and not present challenges uh, to Russia in the international arena, particularly uh, in rebuilding uh, that space, the Eurasian Union space. So uh, that uh, these are the key objectives. Uh, the key uh, objective is make uh, Russia and uh, create its sphere of influence, make it stronger and solidify it while making the uh, international institutions, the ones that were created, by the way, we should not forget, at the end of World War II, to make sure that world wars like that never happen again, to weaken them and to undermine the alliance of democratic free market states that actually Putin sees as posing a threat to the kind of regime that Russia has, which is a, a kleptocratic uh, authoritarian or authoritarian regime, where a small group of people around Putin controls the key resources and industries in Russia, benefits from it, and wants to benefit also from projecting those internationally. But finally, the people, well, that's a huge question. You can make friends with Russians, they're fantastic people, uh, maybe a little bit more intense and dramatic, uh, maybe a little bit more sullen, you know, they may not smile all that much, they have to take classes on how to smile when, when, for the World Cup when, when, when tourists were coming in. Uh, but there has been, after Ukraine and Crimea, watershed change in, Rus in the Russian public opinion. You see that before that, more or less the positive views, the blue line is the positive views of the United States. They dominated the negative views, except a few moments of crisis, like invasion in um, Iraq and the war in Georgia in 2008. But after 2014, the predominant trend is, has, has split and, and, and reversed. And so um, we, we need to understand that part of it is because Putin has also managed to successfully through uh, state-dominated media and social media to successfully project the, that image of the United States and the West being a threat to Russia, uh, wanting to weaken Russia, that Russia needs to rise and constantly contest it, hopefully by weakening us. So, with that, I will pass to you. So, I didn't bury the lead, did I? <laughs> Alright, so I was told six minutes, so I'm going to have to speak fast and click quickly. Um, was Russia the culprit in this story? And while I'm not going to claim that Russia is a good guy, I'm going to say no. The short answer is, Russia did not cause Putin to win the election. <laughs> Freud said sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Okay. <laughs> right. So why did Trump get elected? Uh, genuine misgivings in the American population, which I think if we ignore, we do at our own peril. Okay. Uh, electoral circumstances, which are somewhat unique and probably won't be repeated in the future, a variety of things, including 12 candidates in the Republican Party, and maybe a little overconfidence on the part of the Democrats. Russia helped get out the vote for the Republicans. They did do that. But that's not the same as saying that they created an outcome that couldn't have existed, okay? That they invented uh, Trump and the outcome for the election. All right. So, but if we take this narrative that the Russians did this to us, 
we're going to ignore the fact that a lot of this was done to us by us. And I think that's an important thing to remember, so we need to think about that. That doesn't mean we should ignore Russian meddling in the election. It's a real thing, but let's understand it as it will be. Okay. So this is the one that really got a lot of people scared, right? Because something weird was going on, and we couldn't figure it out. So what hold does Putin have over Trump? Okay. Well, maybe it's because Putin got Trump elected. No, I don't think that's the answer. Uh, first of all, it's not empirically true, and secondly, Trump doesn't seem to hold those kind of views about things. When somebody does him a favor, he doesn't say thank you and show appreciation, he takes it for granted. Okay? So maybe there's that DOS gate thing, and maybe that's what's driving him. Well, this is a guy that doesn't seem to be much affected by a scandal. Right? There was that audio tape where he said unkind things about women and he just went, eh, yeah, so what? So another possibility is that Putin and Trump actually think alike about a lot of things and they're just similar bedfellows. And the story is that they're doing uh, things in, in the international political space especially that they both agree on. So fake news is bipartisan. This is from a recent poll. Okay, 55% of Democrats believe, apparently, either with great confidence or reasonable confidence, that the election was actually created, the outcome of the election was a result of Russian hacking. Okay, well, this is not true. Okay, the White House denies there's any Russian involvement in the election in any way, but even the intelligence agencies have been clear that it's not that the, the Russians did not uh, affect the electoral process directly. They affected the public opinion, which affected how people voted, but that's not the same as going into the polls or going into the electronic uh, voting machines and affecting them directly. Okay. So, in order to understand this, you've got to understand that the three basic kinds of cyber attack that are, could have occurred during the election. One is espionage. Definitely happened. The Russians collected information illegally from sources, including the DNC, by phishing attacks and other means. Information campaign also definitely happened. The Russians used that information to shape public opinion and to build a coalition that helped Trump win the election. No question. The third story is that the Russians actually entered into the voting process itself, and this is not true. Okay? So they shaped the election, they influenced the election, but they didn't hack the voting process. And that's an important distinction. Okay. The reason why it's important to me is that that narrative implies that this could never happen again if we're vigilant. If we follow our voting process and clear it and make sure it's protected and so on. And that's just not true. Because there is a genuine constituency in the United States for the kinds of things that Trump represents. And it's not new. We can go back decades now and see that there's a conservative populist movement that's been rising in the United States that's angry and frustrated, and we ignore it at our own peril. Right? This is a recent uh, uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, excuse me, New York Times article about how the Rust Belt has moved to the right. Okay? Another figure that's really important in this regard is this guy. And we forget about it. He may have had more effect on this election than Vladimir Putin. Why? Because Al-Qaeda's strategy, like any terrorist organization, was to inflate the nature of the threat that they represented and cause us to be disunited and have uh, a, a weakening of our national identity. This is exactly what's happened in the Republican Party. There's a near peer competitor faction, and there's a counter terrorist faction, and Trump represents that faction. The other 11 people running for office were all talking about how Russia was a problem. Trump was not. Okay. Who's really spying on the American public? This guy. <laughs> right? And what happened the other day tells you why this is important, because Wall Street was totally okay with them spying on you, as long as they were spying on you for them. But the moment that the American public wasn't going to have a say in this, and wasn't going to be able to be 
spied on us effectively whilst we got angry at Facebook. Thank you. <laughs> I have no slides. <laughs> I do expect them to take notes to do a test. Um, great. Uh, so the present period has been described as a new Cold War. That may be way too optimistic. That description alone may fail to capture the dangers that we face in our relationship with Russia. The latter half of the Cold War, after the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, was a fairly stable arrangement of managed competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. By the latter half of the Cold War, America and Russia had developed well understood, even of often unspoken, rules to keep our competition from leading to compromises. Is this better? Okay. Uh, uh, to keep our competition from, from spiraling uh, uh, out of control uh, after surprises. Uh, the transition to mutual acceptance of peaceful coexistence of two radically different systems avoided direct confrontation of our forces. In contrast, the earlier half of the Cold War from 1945 until about October 1962 was a far more dangerous period in the early Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union did not recognize the other's areas of most intense security concerns. America and Russia had not developed rules of conduct for using nuclear weapons. America and Russia had not abandoned efforts to subvert the other's political system at home. The current period in American Russian relations much more resembles the earlier and far more dangerous period the Cold War. Today, America and Russia are contesting directly the most vitally important regions, such as Ukraine or Georgia or Estonia. Today, we are less concerned about reinforcing mutual nuclear deterrence with one another, and we are directly, visibly, and obviously engaged in the domestic politics of the other in ways that are anathema to the leadership of the other side. This is a pattern that threatens to create explosive crises with direct confrontations, as it did in the early Cold War in Berlin, 1948, 1959, 1961, and the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. The present is a moment when America needs to stand back, take a broad perspective, and develop a strategy for dealing with our Russia problem over many issues and over the long term. For the United States to advance its interests and to be true to its principles in this world, we need to understand Russia's foreign policy goals. Understanding Russia's goals does not mean granting legitimacy to Russia's goals. Instead, understanding Russia's goals permits us to predict how far Russia is likely to press forward against our own interests. Understanding Russia's goals gives us some ability gauge how far we are likely to get Russia to retreat from its forward positions. Understanding Russia's goals gives us some ability to identify agreements to contain our conflict with Russia and possibly even find areas for mutual benefit. Unfortunately, recent discussions or debates inside America about our relationship with Russia have been characterized by two tendencies that work together to subvert the development of a strategy that serves America's interests and our principles. The first tendency is for Americans to call for lashing out with instant retaliation, such as sanctions, without considering whether these have unintended costs and whether our retaliation is at all effective in changing Russian behavior. The second tendency is the recent debate is that the recent debate of our relationship with Russia is to weaponize our relationship with Russia as a tool to embarrass our domestic political opponents. That is subverting the development of a thoughtful strategy for Russia. 
The time has come to take stock of our relationship with Russia. And for our own sake, America needs to develop a strategy that looks to the long term and encompasses the complex agenda of issues that extend far beyond any one day's headlines. First and most important on this agenda, America and Russia need to contain the competition for political, military, and economic influence in the region that formerly constituted parts of the Soviet Union, countries like Ukraine, Georgia, Estonia. These countries constitute Russia's, uh, what Russia refers to as its near abroad. It is the region of Russia's highest security concerns and where it is most likely to fight against American pressure. Second is arms control. America and Russia need to avoid costly, fruitless, and possibly destabilizing competitions in building nuclear arms. And most importantly, we need to reinforce nuclear deterrence so that Russia never concludes that it, its best option is to launch a nuclear attack against the United States. Third is conflicts in the third world. America and Russia need to develop new, probably unspoken rules for engagements in the third world, such as Syria, so that we limit the chances we will find ourselves unexpectedly shooting at one another. And fourth is Russian and American direct involvement in the internal affairs of the others. I think Eric is right in that Russia did not so far change the election outcome. But meddling in elections is but one dimension of this. This mutual meddling threatens to poison relations in all other areas. This will be a tough question for us in America because it touches on some of our deepest values concerning the promotion of democracy around the world. Nonetheless, America and Russia need to reach, uh, reach agreement, possibly only a tacit agreement, to dial back our involvement in domestic affairs of the others to acceptable levels, as we did in the latter half of the Cold War. Is that 
the implication of your remark. So let's start with Professor Broder just for a minute or two and then go to Professor Garski. Yep. Russian military power is, is, is uh, a small fraction of that of the United States today. It's, its military expenditure each year is about 9% of the U.S. Uh, military budget uh, each year. Uh, with the exception of nuclear, uh, strategic nuclear weapons uh, and main, main battle uh, tanks and so uh, the traditional weapons of the battlefield, it is uh, substantially weaker uh, than the United States in, in military affairs. But in the area of strategic nuclear weapons and in the local areas of the media beyond its borders, it has uh, military, military advantages and ways of matching the United States. Uh, the reason for focusing on uh, arms control, particularly nuclear arms control, is that Mr. Uh, Putin has sent us some very loud messages, one that he delivered uh, in his election speech this year, uh, be before the, the Russian presidential elections, uh, in which he had those, those uh, four or five videos uh, that are now on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs website, which are clearly intended, including the one that has the, uh, the, the warheads raining down on Florida, uh, having been launched from, from Russia. He's sending the message that if we don't have arms, uh, arms control negotiations, they are ready to, uh, to step up and invest in some uh, weapons that uh, will make us less secure, make the United States less secure, and I think has a, a, a major potential for destabilizing uh, the nuclear relationship. It may be that the systems that are featured in his uh, pre-election speech will not, will not be technologically feasible, but what he's saying is the message is they're looking for vulnerabilities that will make America insecure in strategic nuclear weapons. It would be to our advantage to try to reach an agreement as we had in the late Cold War to avoid these fruitless contests uh, in arms. Well, thank you. Um, I think I'll try to say, uh, make two points. One is uh, none of you here probably have threatened Russia. I'm going to guess that. But as a population, as a country, we have to understand enough of their perspective to get what they're about when it comes to these kinds of security issues. We operate in their backyard. They don't operate in our backyard. When I talk to defense folks in the military, they're always surprised. How come we can't deter Russia on its border? Well, because it's their border, and we're a long way away from home trying to tell people how they should behave and what they should do in their neighborhood. And that's their perspective. Now, it doesn't mean we shouldn't do that. It's just we have to understand that from their perspective, the last 20 years has been a series of unmitigated failures. NATO has marched east, taking over territories that used to be in the Soviet sphere of influence, the Russian sphere of influence, is much reduced. And so they feel threatened. And I'm not saying that's legitimate or anything like that. I'm just saying that's their perspective. I think in broad strokes. Understand that. And uh, the idea of arms control is a great one. We have to find somewhere in which we can agree. One of the real realities today is that we're overwhelmingly powerful in conventional terms. One of the reasons that Putin keeps brandishing the nuclear sword is that's pretty much what he's got left. Okay? I would suggest, and this is my second point, what George Kennan said uh, at the outbreak of the first Cold War is no less true today and that much wiser for having been demonstrated as a useful way of thinking about this. That there's a middle path. Don't ignore the threat from Russia. Don't hand them in to the point that they have to act today. And time is on our side. Russia is a oil sheepdom with bad weather and bad dem and worse demographics. Okay? That one of the things that's most affected Russia in recent years are the sanctions. The sanctions didn't get them to stop operating in Ukraine, but they took a trillion dollars off of the Russian economy each year. And over time, what that means is that Russia cannot modernize its forces the way it intended to. 
Now, in the fullness of time, Russia is becoming a smaller country because the population is shrinking. The portion of the population that's growing is the least friendly towards Moscow. Technologically, they've thrown their future under a bus. They had a huge amount of human capital after, at the end of the Cold War, and they decided not to cultivate that, but instead to rely on resources. It made a lot of bad choices, and if we could let them sort of fizzle and, and decay without causing some time pressure for them to act, we will be better off. And in some sense, they will. Okay, interesting. So um, back to this question of Russian goals. I, w I was going to, uh, Professor Alexei, your depiction of Russian goals is kind of unlimited. Extends even to subverting the United States and breaking it up. I don't know if you really believe that that is a realistic objective or not. But I was going to ask your, also your fellow panelists, whether or not they agree that the goals are that unlimited, or are they very much limited to these defensive concerns about Europe? So let, let's talk about the goals a little bit. Go ahead. Well, if I, if I were Putin answering your question, I may answer it um, with one of those Putin's kind of street language almost uh, jokes that he sometimes makes, and one of those he made very politically and correctly in our context uh, with a meeting with the Israeli Prime Minister once, when he said, you can't kiss all the women in the world, but you should keep trying. <laughs> so that, I think, is the, 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 the perspective on the unlimited, you know, I think you caught that really very well. That, that you know, I, what I mapped out is the maybe the ideal type, right? Of, 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 right, what right, what the, right? What would be he? Of course, they understand that they cannot achieve all those goals. Uh, but the idea is to keep trying and uh, use any advantage that um, the, the unfolding situations may present to advance those kinds of goals. So, uh, as far as you know, the, the defense of India, I, I also wanted to add in a sense a nuclear, a nuclear question. Uh, it's really, I think really we need to put a lot more thinking into that, because in some ways there is a difference. I don't think we can go back simply to the same blueprint we had in the late Cold War with the arms controls agreements like START or INF. In fact, Russia has been violating INF blatantly, and we haven't been doing much about it. If, if, if I were in the US Congress, I would be raising a lot more heat uh, regarding that issue uh, because Putin and, and the Russian military doctrine also changed with respect to nuclear weapons. So the Soviet leadership saw the nuclear weapons as a way to create the image of a great power for the Soviet Union to uh, ward off potential uh, American uh, nuclear attack that they believe imperialists might unleash on the Soviet Union. But then. Uh, since Khrushchev's 1956 speech, peaceful coexistence, compete economically and show that it's a better life, better society, and then people will turn to you. But this is different now. Putin uses uh, nuclear power more strategically. Um, shortly before annexing Crimea, one of the things that Russia did was carry out large-scale ballistic missile and space weapon exercises to kind of send a message. Do you want to escalate to that? You know, so taking us to kind of that thinking that we may have to suffer that kind of... Do you want to go back to that kind of brinkmanship and military confrontation? But they are willing to, to go that extra step, you know, yeah, to... to, uh, to, to and, and so I, I think um, we, when we think about nuclear uh, strategy, uh, it, it, it's important to understand that difference and, and uh, uh, strengthening the deterrent is... Uh, in, in whatever way, we don't have to be very creative on that, it's very important. Finally, just one quick thing. Ukraine was the third largest nuclear power after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and it's not missing on anybody in Ukraine that if they kept the nuclear weapons, Crimea wouldn't have happened, Donbass wouldn't have happened. Um, in, in the opinion polls, 86% of respondents, 90% of respondents say that. Tell, tell, tell us that. Well, and I'm sure that uh in Pyongyang, they're also aware of that lesson as well as the Libya lesson. Um, 
so one one final question and then we'll open it up to the audience. So audience, be thinking about your questions and we're going to have microphones out there for you to ask your questions. One of the big mysteries is how popular is Vladimir Putin? And we personalize the Russian threat so much just as, you know, like a Hitler or a Stalin and a Putin um, or a Xi Jinping. Um, but how popular is, is Putin? Do people support his uh, hostile approach to the United States? And do they cheer on evidence that uh, there was interference in our domestic elections? Uh, why don't we start with that? Yeah, well, uh, you're not a Russia expert, so let's have Bill start. <laughs> I mean, certainly all the polls indicate that, that Putin is, you know, is, is normally successful and that they do seem to track when he takes a more forceful stand against the United States. There is, is an increase uh, in his popularity. The real problem, of course, is that in a, in a system such as, as Russia, uh, where there is, is you know, some fear that there's, that there's a right answer and giving the wrong, giving the wrong answer to a poll question, uh, there may be consequences. We never know uh, precisely uh, how popular he is. I don't think anyone is contending that he is not popular. I think we're disputing over whether it is 88% popularity or something more you know, a little bit closer to say 50% popularity. Uh, but there's no way, no way at all to, uh, to sort that out. We don't have any independent measures. Um, I just, the important point about how popular is Putin is that, I mean, that is, I think the question you're, you're also alluding to is, is, is the answer to improving relations getting rid of Putin? And I would say that that is unlikely. That, you know, that we're overlooking the fact that our relationship with Russia has, for the most part since 1917, been a very contentious and difficult relationship. And the real exceptions to this have been few and far between. The 1990s was an exceptional and extraordinary period, but it was largely due to the fact that Russia was so weakened due to the collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of its economy, the, uh, the uh, in domestic turmoil associated with the independence of the provinces like Chechnya, and a grossly incompetent um, after 1996, who may have been incapacitated by, uh, by stroke, who knows what it is that produced this, or whether it was just simply alcohol. Um, but the, this combination of weakness in the center, that Russia was in no, no way in a position uh, to stand up for what I think most Russians see as, as their interests. Uh, and now we are in a position, since Putin has come to power, uh, with where we have a stronger leadership where a restored economy and where they are uh, standing up uh, to defend their, what they see as their interests and what they see as an America operating on their very, on their very borders, uh, pushing a lot of NATO within 85 uh, miles of its uh, near uh, second largest city uh, and within about 200 miles or so of, uh, of Moscow. Uh, and that they feel quite uh, that the world is dangerous and that they need to uh, push back. I think that's very unfortunate. I wish they would just learn to love us. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I think that view uh, is, uh, is quite unrealistic. And so I think we're going to have to deal with this Russia problem for a long time. And the question is not getting rid of uh, the Russia problem, it is managing it so it does not spiral out of control. Uh, exploding uh, unexpectedly uh, in, in these surprising encounters like we've had in Syria. Very briefly. Uh, yes, since I have done all the polls in Russia and I can compare, you know, there are those uh, polls that come out that give Putin 80% approval rates, particularly the partisan polls. Lev Kutkov of the Nevada Center admitted 
in conversations with actors that they do use waiting schemes to bump up Putin's rating in those polls. When I conduct some of my own scholarly polls in Russia, they would show that it's less, but it's not 50, it's more like 68% or something like that. So not 80%, but 65, 68%. And one other thing, they used to be in the late 40s, uh, even though officially they were in the 60s or 70s uh, before the Crimea. After the Crimea gave Putin about a 20-point boost that has not gone down, so that rattling around the flag is still there, regardless of the decline of the ruble in the economy. Okay, very interesting. Okay, now um, I think, are people supposed to stand behind microphones, or how are we going to do this? What? Okay, line up on the far end of this. Please come over if you want to ask a question. Come over to this side and why not? Oh, both sides? Okay, both sides, sorry. Okay, whoever gets there first gets there. Uh, let's get started. Okay, yes, sir. Please, uh, please identify. Are you just want to hold it? Okay. Say your name. Uh, yes, my name is Daniel Coffey, and uh, I think I have a lot of different thoughts, but. Oh, wait, wait, excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt. Two rules for this conversation. One, short questions and questions, not speeches. Secondly, <laughs> secondly, one question, not two. Each person gets one question. Yes? Yeah, I was just trying to get the context. Okay. My, my question is, is that it seems to me that we're fighting the last war like every other defeated nation. And we don't we need to look at what's happening to us in the form of being attacked by a new weapon that people are not really taking advantage of. I mean we're we are being attacked psychologically. And, and you know, nuclear weapons are great, but we're sort of balanced on that. And I'm wondering why it is that we're not more concerned. Is it that it's bloodless or that it's you know, it seems neutral somehow, but we are under a severe attack. From Russia. Yeah. Uh, you know, Wait, your question is why are we not more concerned about being under psychological attack? Right? Yeah, I mean, this is this is the craziness of it all. Okay. Uh, uh, would anyone get briefly? <laughs> under attack from Russia since 1917. That a centerpiece of the Russian Revolution and Lenin strategy what used to be called budget talk, education and propaganda. And this has been going on since 1917. What we have learned is how to deal with it. But throughout that, those periods, we had the Communist Party of the United States, we had front organizations for labor, nuclear disarmament, uh, and both covert uh, uh, propaganda and overt propaganda. Uh, disinformation that we hear a lot about today actually was a buzzword back in the 1970s. And you probably didn't hear about it, but it was the our defense department was it was, it was uh, apoplectic about this the threat that this posed. The current propaganda effort uh, RT and WikiLeaks or Lucifer 2 and so forth is a direct lineal descendant of these practices from the past. Okay, we're not okay. That's a really interesting and important point. Eric, did you want to respond? I'm, I'm going to just concur with uh, Dr. Roeder. Um, there is the potential, because of these new means with cyber attacks, for something different to happen. But one of the points I was trying to make in my presentation is that so far, that's not what's been happening. They've been using these new techniques in more traditional ways to carry out information campaigns shape public opinion, as opposed to directly using techniques to attack the voting system or potentially to, to affect their infrastructure and things like that. Those are all potential capabilities, and in fact, the US has them as well. And one thing to remember is we're fighting these battles also. Um, when, when this stuff came out, most of the people in the cyber community went, man, eh, what's the big deal? We've been doing this for years. All those colored revolutions in Central and Eastern Europe, CIA was doing all kinds of stuff to shape opinion and so on. So that's not new. It's new means, but not new in terms of this process.
process record. Okay, briefly. Well, Look at the lines. Something <laughs> Look at the lines. Okay, there is, there is something new though, and, and uh, yes, the Soviet, uh, you know, KGB had the active measures uh, programs for years, and they tried to stabilize various societies in the West and Western democracies in different ways. But I think one of the differences is that in those years, they uh, explicitly articulated their ideology of communism as being hostile to capitalism, and, and so the enemy was easy to see and mobilize against. Putin obfuscates them. It reminds me of some conversations I had on the first day when, when the Russian forces moved into the Crimea. And I sent a message to my colleagues in Game 7 match, and you know, they got it. And I got those angry emails from colleagues at top universities in the United States saying, What do you know? You know, they might not even be the Russian troops. You know, they don't have any insignia. And I said, Well, that's precisely why they are the Russian troops. So the, the, way, the, way, the way that, the way that, the way that, uh, so dashing communism and explicitly, in fact, being anti-communist plays into Putin's hands because it makes it easier for him to obfuscate. Okay, over here. My name is Ross Lopez. I'm asking about super PACs. They are the black hole in the United States and they one of the main things that causes the biggest trouble. There is no oversight. How do we know that the Russians aren't flushing them with money? How, how can the government guarantee us those institutions are not being supported by foreign funds other than their work. The institutions only have to say they're obeying. Is there a question? Is that My question, question is, is how, how can, does any of you know what the oversight is of those institutions to prevent? I think, that, uh, I think it's, uh, right now it's in the courts actually about what are the requirements for super PACs to, uh, I'm sure Congresswoman David probably knows more than those of us up here, but I believe this is an issue that is now being fought out in American courts. Is that right? Okay. Okay, next question. Hi. There's, uh, it is being contested in the courts, and there could be legislation in Congress if it was allowed, allowed by the majority. Hi, Richard Restution. I was wondering, in the panel's opinion, what the probability of a Russian military invasion is to the country of Estonia, and what that might mean for the rest of the world. Okay, can I we broaden it to the Balkans more generally, or just this? Maybe Estonia. Start with Estonia. Professor Dorsey. All right. In the interest of time, the answer is very small, but not zero. Uh, the pattern so far has been that the Russians react to situations. Um, if you look at Georgia, if you look at uh, Ukraine, when they're in situations where they see opportunities or the status quo slipping away, they're increasingly tempted to use force. And the thing about Estonia and Baltics is it's, a, it's already over. They, they've lost this. The Russian population in these places are so stricter, and we have to be very careful about it. Just, yeah. And to target that, I mean, actually, I think the answer, as Eric indicated, is how Estonia treats Narva, how uh, uh, Latvia uh, treats the Dago Pills areas. That is, how do they treat their Russian minorities? on their eastern borders with Russia, do they create a, an exploitable opportunity for the Russians that exist, that would be like what existed in Crimea or the Donbass? And we don't, you know, we need to put a lot of pressure on our allies in NATO that their central governments can be much more accommodating toward, towards their own minorities so they don't create an explosive internal situation that the Russians can exploit. Okay, great. No, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we're, we're going to try to have one person and hope to answer the question. Yeah. Tom and um, SDSU. <clears throat> this is for Dr. Garnsky. Uh, you alluded to this a little bit uh, in your last response, but I wanted to just call back to your slides. Uh, the last point on what they actually have, the Russian that they have accomplished. 
uh, had Part A and Part B. Part A said that they actually did try to hack the electoral process. And so I, I wonder, I mean, you know, given the fact that uh, that kind of cyber warfare is rather cheap, it's much cheaper than building tanks and whatever else, um, don't you think that they're actually going to try until they actually can accomplish something? And I, I just wonder about our response, given the 30-minute cabinet meeting that President Trump just recently had to consider starting to do. I think actually it was two hours. Um, they, what they managed to do in, in several states was gain access to, to voting rolls to find out information. And I don't doubt that that was used to help shape their information campaign. Those of you that are on social media, you're a small part of the problem. Right? Uh, I tell my students all the time, you, the business model for social media is to sell intelligence about you that you gave to them. So, and you know, when Facebook lost uh, the largest capital in the history of the world the other day, it wasn't because they had given stuff to the Russians, it's because they announced that they were gonna stop giving things to Wall Street, okay? When you're on social media, you don't get to choose who's gonna have your information, everybody who can pay for it will have it. Now, we'll pass some laws, hopefully, eventually, that say you can't sell it to the Russians. But they're still going to sell it to Wall Street. Wall Street is an odd ton better, in some people's opinion, than some of the bad guys out there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they're going to be trying to go down. Uh, with Walter Bayes. Uh, I want to ask about uh, Russian dissident Garry Kasparov, who seems to have a rather different view of the history of the 90s. To, to me, it seems like Kasparov uh, almost blames America and the West for failing to interfere in Russia, the democratic processes at the time when Putin and the mafia took over Russia. And uh, if only we had stepped in to save them, we should have you know, sent the CIA to support their vote to make sure that the good guys won. Now, I, I don't know about that. I'd like to know what you think about uh, Kasparov's ideas about the 90s. Quite extensively involved through our, our age of democracy programs in the 1990s, um, uh, spending I mean, substantial uh, sums of money. Uh, the National Endowment for, for Democracy gave very extensive uh, support to developing democratic procedures. Our close working relationship with parties like Yabuka and Right Cause, uh, which the Republicans and the Democrats respectively uh, you know, took, took under their wing, uh, was, uh, was quite uh, substantial. We gave uh, a very hefty uh, IMF loan on the eve of the presidential election in 1996 to make sure that you know one. We were heavily involved in any number of ways throughout that period. The sad thing is that the people we backed did miserably. The people that I wish had won those elections shrunk to less than 5% of the overall vote by, by uh, 2000. They were just, they performed miserably. Western-oriented liberal parties, either you know, Republican-oriented or Democratic-oriented, uh, performed miserably. They did not offer a message that the Russian Okay, Carol, would you like to? Should I say, uh, it's of course all past history now, two turning points. One was 1993 standoff between Yeltsin and the Parliament, uh, and it was a very tough choice because uh, it was the, the opportunity uh, to see where Russia, whether Russia would go to the rule of law or to the rule of men. So we had a choice to support the Parliament that was, and the Supreme Court that was carrying on the impeachment proceedings, or Yeltsin. Yeltsin positioned himself as an anti-communist, the majority of the Parliament were communists, and so we supported the personality. And since then on, the Constitution was rewritten, and basically I watched all that, and I watched our ambassador in Moscow make all these statements and support the Yeltsin, and I cried, because I realized that that's the end of uh, the hope for Russia becoming a democratic state. It will only be a matter of time when somebody will come back and use the opportunities created by the new system. And the other one was Chechnya. We did nothing, you know. Tens of thousands of civilians exterminated 
on the orders from the Kremlin, and we called it a bump on the road to democracy. And we, 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 so, so that created the perception that we often don't mean what we say. We lip service to democracy, but when it comes to actually, um, you know, creating consequences when you deviate from the rules, we didn't have it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm Dave Bergman. Uh, my question is for Dr. Gorsky. Uh, in your list of uh, speculations about uh, Trump's apparent affinity for Putin, do you think uh, the possibility of financial uh, entanglements <coughs> with uh, Russia and Lord Putin and his cronies uh, deserves a vote? Yes. I'll admit that I didn't, uh, didn't include that, and that's an oversight on my part. I think that's certainly a uh, uh, salient part of this. But I would go back to the point that I, I've been hard-pressed to find any moment in Trump's history where he seemed publicly aware of his own fallibility as a human being. <laughs> Despite mountains of evidence, he just keeps trudging along. And so, you know, it could be that you could take him down by some scandal, but the hard, harder part than that would be, even if you had that evidence and you showed it in his face, he might still refuse to believe that he was going to be taken down by that evidence. You have to actually show it, right? So it wouldn't have that deterrent uh, because the psychology is wrong on his part. Uh, now, I'm not saying that this is not possible. I don't know. Something weird is happening, but some of the weirdness is just Trump. Right? The guy has weird ideas. And uh, there is this movement that came out of 9-11. We told our American public that terrorists are the biggest threat that they face. Despite the fact that they're more likely to get bitten by a rattlesnake and hit by lightning on the same moment than hurt by terrorists. So there's a big group of people out there uh, amongst you that think the biggest threat we face is terrorism. And the fact of the matter is that if you think that, Russia's not a bad ally in that objective, except that Russia might be the biggest threat, in which case you make the wrong choice. Hi, Dennis Baker. Uh, given that Sevastopol and the Crimea is Russia's largest naval base in the Black, Black Sea, and that sanctions most likely will not reverse the annexation, what do you think our policy should be going forward? Okay, Crimea policy. Uh, you want to take that on? You want to take this? We have to make, make a hard choice. That is, um, if we think that Russia is going to retreat from Crimea, I think we're betting on a real long shot. And therefore, we can expend an enormous amount of energy on poison and many other issues. Uh, I think that we may end up with a situation where we never recognize the annexation of Crimea, uh, but we instead, on U.S. government maps, put a little, little note in the bottom that the United U.S. government does not recognize the annexation of Crimea uh, to Russia, which is something we did from 19. Uh, until 1991 with the Baltic states. That is, we never recognized it, but we realized we couldn't undo it until 1991. We moved on. Alternatively, Donbass, I think, is a negotiable issue, and I think uh, uh, that is the, the eastern provinces where these, these secessionist governments in Donetsk and uh, Lugansk uh, currently are present, the Don River Basin. Donbass, uh, that area uh, is probably open for negotiation, but the price that Putin asks may be well beyond what we're willing uh, to offer. He may well want to see a uh, feminization of Ukraine, that is a mutual agreement to the neutrality of Ukraine so that it cannot join NATO um, or join the uh, collective security treaty organization. Uh, they were tied to Russia. Okay. Just add a couple of things in Ukraine as well. Um, the, uh, uh, I agree that you know, non recognition and long term strategy, and, and I would add just two things. First of all, uh, 
I think the question should be not whether we should ease the sanctions if Russia does something right or does something good for us on some other issue, uh, but to actually do send the message that even though we realize it's unrealistic, but say every year, as long as the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister remains occupied by Russia, raise the sanctions a little bit. I do think it, it affected Putin quite a bit when the wife of his close buddy, Tim Chinko, wanted to use the Visa card to pay for her uh, facelift and couldn't. And, 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 and I think more of those kinds of things, if you can add just a few of them, uh, but, but, but keep adding. So just to keep on, and that will do also raise the spirit of people in Ukraine. Because we, I, I think not just think of how what we do would affect Russia, but what does it do to Ukraine? We want the Ukrainian people to be optimistic that the West cares about them, that the democratic states, you know, can include them. Because the society in Ukraine, unlike the Russian society, has really changed since the post-Soviet times. And it did develop deeply entrenched democratic values that have not even been shaken by, you know, war experiences of the day. So I think we should keep that in mind. But it is important not to look at each of these issues in isolation. We need to look at these as part of a complex relationship in which each uh, can facilitate or poison uh, agreement on other issues. And raising sanctions uh, every year that Crimea remains part of Russia uh, could cost an awful lot. We need to have a hard discussion. How important is Crimea versus agreement on these other issues? Final kind of thought, um, SDSU, um, a phrase that hasn't come up, Mueller investigation. You probably decided why it wouldn't. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. But as this continues, what's something good and what's something bad in its effect on long-term Russian relations? Okay. How has the Mueller investigation impacted U.S.-Russia relations? <laughs> um, I mean, of course, none of us are American politics experts here, but um, on the U.S. record, that's a fair question for sure. I mean, uh, Miller's uh, investigation, at least the indictments that have come out so far, have been remarkably professional and focused on. Uh, the actions of Russian agents, both in the Internet Research Agency and in the GRU, um, and have documented very carefully what the Russians are doing. Um, it is simply, I think, sending the message to the Russians, we are fully aware of what you're doing. Uh, there are no secrets. I'm not sure that that changes the game at all. I think it is imperative that we uh, prosecute violations of American and that's all that the indictments are, are doing on the, on the case of it. Otherwise, I think, you know, I think the important thing that we're missing about, about this is that why did Putin engage in this uh, or, or let this go along? Why did they do it in such a visible and easily traceable way with handles like Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear that everybody knew was going to trace it? right back to the GRU. Why did they do it? GRU meaning the main administration, or just the main intelligence administration, the main administration uh, for intelligence in the, in the defense okay. ministry in Russia. Um, why, did, why did they do it this way? And you know, I think Putin is sending a signal that though he has plausible deniability, that is, there's nothing to trace it back to him. It is clear the Russian government is involved. And the signal he's trying to send is we need to negotiate about meddling in the internal affairs of the other side. And he's driven this message home again by when we said, when we issued the indictment of the 12 GRU agents uh, about two weeks ago now, um, that they immediately came back and said, sure, I'll let you interrogate these people if you send me the, the former American ambassador whom he had accused of meddling in Russian affairs. He's, I think, serious about in, uh, actually interrogating the fault. 
but he's trying to put on the, on the table the agenda. We need to talk about this and perhaps come to mutual agreements to dial back this meddling in the internal affairs that really bothers him and really bothers us. I'm not saying that we should, that we'll reach an agreement because we may to commit we, we may decide we can't sacrifice uh, promoting democracy in Russia and we can live with the Russian meddling in our own elections. If that's the conclusion, then we won't we won't dial that. But we may in fact, after a hard analysis, decide it is in both of our interests to reach some sort of accommodation, perhaps unspoken, unwritten, that we each dial back uh, our involvement in the other side's affairs. Do you think that's possible? Um, I, think I mean, why would, why, why, would, uh, why would Putin trust us to leave our commitments, and why would we trust or believe their commitments? Well, it's a mutually assured destruction relationship. That is, if, if they meddle next time, we, we meddle, meddle back. Um, and that each has to, uh, it is a, as long as the other side abstains from meddling in the other's affairs, above some tolerable threshold, I mean, you're not going to get rid of, of, of meddling, but if you can dial it back to acceptable levels, um, and as each, each side observes this, as in so many parts of international relations, uh, we might uh, have a, a, uh, uh, an arrangement that, that makes both of us significantly happier and, and more comfortable. Just very quickly, I think it is very important not to allow the Mueller investigation to be killed uh, by the partisan politics in Washington. And <laughs> and that indictment of 12 GIU is stellar work. You know, 12 names that were not supposed to be known to anybody, flashed, flashed out in the public. That's the reason we needed that it should be a kind of point where we say, you know, politics ends at border's edge. This is this is not about Trump victory in 2016. This is about protecting our national security at the very basic level. Uh, right. It seems to me that the uh, Democratic Party is asleep. When will the Democratic Party wake up to aggressively contest the November election? And perhaps, uh, perhaps Congressman Davis could comment on that also. So I think you're talking about the November 2018 election? I'm talking about the upcoming elections, which is perhaps more important than anything that's going on now. Okay, well, maybe you can make some remarks in your conclusion. Yeah, that would be good. Yes. Hi, my name is Martin Krugman. I'm in Susan's district, and I want to thank you very much for, uh, for a very informative program. Here's my question. You have mentioned Ukraine, you've mentioned uh, uh, Georgia, and uh, you've mentioned Estonia. Let me throw out a trio of other countries. And the question is, should those countries be concerned if they were in Latvia, Mongolia, and Azerbaijan? Okay, so is Russia a imminent threat to Latvia, Azerbaijan, my Mongolia? Uh, Eric, do you have some second or do you have <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I don't, I'm not a subject expert on those places. Uh, one of the things that I think is sometimes tempting for a very powerful country is to pretend it's interested in every place, but not do the hard work of deciding where it really has principal values. And I think if the United States has one fundamental error in the last generation is we went and carried out two atrocious, very costly wars. Right? We talk about uh, Chechnya. Well, our Chechnya was Iraq. And we don't have the excuse, in some sense, that the Russians have for Chechnya. I'm not saying it's an excuse, but it's part of what Russia sees as Russia. And Iraq is not part of the United States. But we went there and we caused a lot of uh, mayhem on a pretty flimsy premise. And most of the public said, whatever, and didn't care very much. 
And I think it would be useful in the future for us to ask questions about whether Mongolia is really important and we need to be involved, or whether it's not. And uh, if it's not, to make that clear to the world so that they don't make false decisions. One of the bad things we did uh, to Georgia was we left them with the impression that we were going to back them up if they stood up to Russia. And we weren't. And so they stood up to Russia and they got caught. And that wasn't good for anybody. Briefly on Latvia, I would say very similar answer that you guys gave on Estonia. Uh, on Mongolia, not much because of China. Restaurant in China, so they, they're not going to move. But that's their right job. After they have been doing uh, quite a lot of things regarding the government. One of the biggest things that the energy policy is trying to make sure that any pipeline going west from, from the Bangalore oil doesn't have enough supply. And that's also part of the game of the, with Iran and Iran to divert those supplies elsewhere. So, so that, that. Yeah. Hello, my name is Manu. Um, speaking about the need to support uh, the Mueller investigation as part of the Justice Department and the misinformation, for example, when you mentioned the terrorism being the number one threat, what is the medium and long term impact on our institutions of all of this misinformation, especially the ones generated even here, not just the Russian threat, but the ones we are responding to? You mean our democratic institutions are? All of our institutions, I believe that the institutions are vicarious us from these moments. So all of them, um, the, the, the civil service, the institutions that carry us, um, Congress is uh, one that worries me a lot, but in general, every other institution that, that serves us. Well, I think uh, Professor, yeah, you want to say something about that? Listen, uh, misinformation thrives in two settings. One is where the government or some other central entity controls your access to information. And the other is in which the public either is, doesn't care or doesn't want to know the truth. Right? We could be in neither of those situations as long as the American public does its patriotic duty and pays attention. I tell my students. Like all of you right here. Exactly. You're, you're part of the solution because you come to things like this. I tell my students the internet is not the truth. You have to go find media sources that you can trust and rely upon, and you still have to triangulate. But don't just cite the internet because it's mostly nonsense. And we, as, as a population, humanity's gotten very good at repeating nonsense to each other. We now do it with computers at high rates of speed. And so you just can't trust something that you can't source correctly. And if you don't pay attention to the source, then you're going to get lied to, and you know, that's going to be a problem. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Bernadine, and my question is mostly directed to Dr. Alexia. You had a slide, uh, and it showed the United States broken up into four uh, areas in what I think was described as what is a, a goal of Putin's is to see the United States broken up. And anybody that spent any time on social media can see that that's already happening, and it's very, very frightening. We've seen the strength of, of, of what Putin can do in, in our election already. And to see our United States broken up into four pieces um, in, in an effort by Putin to weaken our country is very, very frightening and very disturbing. And I think it's probably why so many people are here today. My question to Dr. Alexia, as somebody who really, truly, I think, understands the power of Russia, how do we as Americans combat that from happening? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, that map, by the way, is not actually the strategic plan of Putin. I use it to illustrate the idea to create divisions within the United States on many levels, racial, you know, uh, regional, uh, economic, etc., etc. Uh, but uh, with, with, with respect uh, you know, uh, to what to do about it, I think uh, we could still draw lessons from uh, 
uh, article X that George Kennan wrote back in 1946, when he said that uh, in the attempt to contain Soviet communism, our biggest threat is not that uh, we will lose some skirmish or two, but in the attempt to defeat them, we will become like them. So I think we need to strengthen our democratic institutions. We need to strengthen our debate. We need to strengthen the inclusiveness of our society. You know, uh, and, 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 and I think that's what made America great from the beginning, speaking like somebody who <laughs> migrated to the United States and the nation of immigrants. You know, I, I think we need to develop those kinds of things. I, I, I think that is ultimately our biggest strength and our biggest weapon against those kinds. Is there a possibility of using other nations as competitors for Russia to blunt their strategic goals, such as uh, China, Saudi Arabia, and India, to potentially create a second front, as opposed to just focusing on NATO and former uh, Soviet states? Okay, why don't you just pass this to your... Yeah, we're going to ask a big question. Yeah, my name is uh, Jeff Mason, and thank you again for coming to me. Uh, this is a question primarily to Dr. Broder. Um, maybe I misinterpreted his comments, uh, but I felt that he was suggesting a path towards a, a meeting Putin halfway, which could be conceived of as some kind of appeasement. And within that question is the role of NATO and what is uh, Mr. Trump's uh, uh, effect in his current stance towards NATO and potentially weakening. This is kind of tied to the question the woman asked about the divisions in, in the United States. My recollection is that Putin once commented that the country who controls artificial intelligence first will be the winner. I'm wondering what we know the U.S. is doing to win the battle and stop the Russians or others from having artificial intelligence control greater than ours or first. Okay, great. AI. This question is about whoever, uh, Putin once said that whoever is the best at AI will. Okay, but we're going to move on to finish the questions and then we'll go through and get some answers. My name is John Forrester. It strikes me that Putin really does not have a great deal of power. He is limited in what he can do. He has chosen to take low expense efforts. He didn't come out too well in Georgia. I don't know how much he put into supporting Assad, but most of what he has done is low expense regard of how much he might benefit or in the way of cost and profit and loss system. So how much should this consideration guide American policy? Okay. Okay. Great question. Yes. Next question. Bonnie Curry, I'd like to know to what extent does the Russian mafia carry out state-sponsored activities and does it not break independently at all? Okay, where is the mafia? I've seen that movie. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name's Paula, and I, I was interested in the comments on the poisoning in England. Uh, the, the Russians have usually, you know, targeted their own this is different in that there's collateral exposures to the public, uh, emergency response, etc. And it seemed to me like to be a change. So I just wanted your comments. Okay. Uh, my name is Richard Newman. Uh, my question is, um, given the 
present administration um, and their uh, annihilation of the State Department and other uh, government processes, um, do you feel that the threat is worse because of the actions of our current administration in terms of, of behavior and the long term, we're losing, we're losing people in the State Department uh, uh, and concerned with, with, uh, with career diplomats in terms of solving these problems. It's impressive to me to hear the three of you talk. I, I appreciate the thoughtfulness that you put in. I just wonder if we're losing that within government circles because of the kind of activity that Find Thank you. Okay, our last question. My name is Robert Jenkins, Congresswoman Susan Davis, with much respect. Uh, my question is directed to Professor Garstein. I believe I well understood that we have a lot more nuclear weapons than uh, Russia, but it only takes a few. So, from a technical and physical standpoint, what are we doing to make sure that they can't sneak a bomb up here offshore or sneak a dirty bomb over the border? Okay. Okay, great. Well, these questions uh, extend to many different areas, but why don't each of you take a few of these and try to answer them briefly? Um, you can? You want to get started? Um, you can meet in Putin halfway uh, comment. Uh, the, um, uh, I take issue with uh, Trump's statement, uh, which sounds uh, on the surface of it very appealing. You know, let's improve relations with Russia. Isn't it better to get along? Uh, good relations, um, good relations always better than bad relations. But then if, I, I, I challenge that because I'm not sure we should improve relations for improving the relate for the sake of improving relations, uh, and certainly not shaking hands uh, with Putin and not calling him Vladino would be a good idea. Uh, I, I do think, again, the effect on Ukraine and other states, and yes, calculate exactly what we need to do with Russia to make sure we don't shoot at each other, but beyond that, don't do much else. Uh, and, and I think uh, we need to put more distance with that. Because ultimately, if we do get along, we'll be promoting the kind of goals that I mapped out. Uh, Russia is not going to cooperate with us to make us stronger you know, or, to, or to create win-win situation. It's going to uh, cooperate in that kind of one-sided way. And then the, the other point, we bring to the other point is, why did Putin support Trump? It's not because I don't think um, Trump said we want to improve relations with Russia, but because Putin believes that Trump will make America weaker. Uh, that, that the make America great again will turn into the opposite. And, and, and that is why he, and, and if you think about it, you know, Trump is playing into those Putin's issues with trade wars in Europe, with undermining NATO credibility, and things like that. And finally, just one thing on the market, a very good question. Um, I, I don't know which movie you mentioned, Susan, I, but I would highly recommend to you to read the book or watch the, there's a movie, but the book is better, of course, by John McCurry, and it's called Our Kind of Traitor. And it covers a lot of those things, including collusion, potentially. If you substitute a few things, now you will get a good insight, and I think that, that John McCurry knows his stuff. Thank you. Okay. Um, I take exception to being accused of advocating appeasement. That is a loaded word from a horrible period in history. We're beginning, my party, not the Democrat, sorry, um, is beginning to sound like the John Lewis Society in the 1950s, where we are accusing people of, of all sorts of outrageous things. We have weaponized our relationship with Russia in ways that are very destructive. My position was, and it is, we need to be hard-headed about our own interests and to serve those rather than lashing out mindlessly against Russia for revenge or whatever purpose. And we need to find ways in which we can serve our interests 
by standing tough when it's necessary, but also finally looking for areas in which it may be possible that we have a shared interest in stepping back from a mutually destructive encounter. That's serving our interest as a nation, not appeasement. And I think it is very important to keep those keep hard-headed thinking about our interest in dealing with this, country, this other country uh, in, in mind. Uh, on the question about the, the weak position of Russia, um, I think that actually is a very important thing to keep in mind, but I think Russia sees itself as in a very weak and, and threatened position, uh, that I think it actually is, and that it is operating on its very borders uh, in places like South Ossetia, uh, or uh, in, in Crimea, uh, that is a very important. That they are very opportunistic that, uh, and that they are taking advantages of ways that they can weaken the United States, tie America's hands. Uh, they're looking for specific points of leverage like the veto in the United Nations. Uh, and they are using weapons of the weak rather than uh, a direct military confrontation with the United States. They're using propaganda uh, and misinformation and the like. And that is, a, that is a reality that we're going to learn to have to deal with and, in fact, develop some very, uh, very clear ways of protecting ourselves against that and containing uh, any danger that might pose the United States. Any comments about the poisoning in England? I don't, you know, I, I believe that the news story is that it's indeed uh, you know, a Russian operation. Uh, but what is most puzzling is uh, why is it so obvious that it, it traced back? Why do you use no mature? There are ways to off defecting spies where there would be much more ambiguity about why they died. I mean, a bungled burglary uh, would, would do the same effect, and it would send a chilling message other spies. This is what, what is puzzling about this is what are the Russians signaling to us that what do they want us to take away? One really bizarre thing is that uh, you know that why did they do it and then uh, the sanctions followed. It was so predictable that the sanctions were going to follow. Uh, why did one Putin do this, or permit this, this operation to go forward, and I'm sure that it did not go forward without his approval. Why did he permit this to go forward, uh, knowing that it was going to use sanctions against him, like expulsion of diplomatic personnel? Did he want the expulsion of diplomatic personnel? One of the bizarre things is the outcome of all this is that, in fact, they then countered by expelling all of our personnel. We have very few eyes and uh, in, in these remote cities in Russia right now. We don't know what's going on. We have very much less contact with the dissidents than we did before. In the next round, if Putin decides that he's going to you know, tighten the autocratic control one more, uh, one more level, we're going to have much less say in that, much less contact with the opposition than we did before. Did Putin plan this? I don't know. It is a very mysterious yeah. uh, set of events. Okay. Uh, uh, another possible explanation for the Novacek attack in, in the UK is a principal agency problem. Putin gives the order, and then his minions go out and execute it based upon their own decisions about how to do things. To me, it's very plausible that he's dealing with people who aren't first caliber here, right? That they're trained and operate in an environment in which they have total discretion domestically, right? They don't get arrested by their own cops for doing stuff like this because they're the cops, right? So, um, I mean, instead of thinking everything that Putin does is some kind of super genius 14 move grand strategy, a lot of these things are, oh, Something's happening. I have to react. Here's, you know, here's the the box that says what to do when we do it. Um, the Novacek to me looks like a screw up, where some lower-ranking person decided how to carry out the instructions they were given, 
And it wasn't what Putin wanted, but that's what he ended up with. Um, AI. AI, there are a bunch of people who are in the know on this who believe, and I could go on and on about AI, but very briefly, um, arguably... Artificial intelligence for yeah. people who haven't... Yeah, for, for, for people like me that don't have a lot of organic intelligence, because it's exciting <laughs> and, and nerve-wracking. Um, basically, uh, the process here is to take humans more and more out of the loop of a variety of decision-making. If you think this is new, all you have to do is go down to the harbor here and look at one of the destroyers that's in the harbor. They have a spy one radar system where you can flip the switch and it will make all the decisions about who gets shot and when, how, and all that stuff. Okay? We don't turn it on very much because we're a little nervous we might cheat down a bird or whatever. Okay. So, or Iranian aircraft, commercial aircraft, right? So, AI has this huge potential. Um, a lot of countries are interested in it. The Russians, I don't think, are going to be real players. One of the things that I think is very evocative is Putin is making a lot of noise about how high-tech this stuff is right now. If you, if you can actually walk the walk, you don't need to talk. Okay? Uh, the real threat in this area is China. But their model is completely different, and it's a different story for a different day. But basically, theirs is top-down. Our approach to technology has always been bottom-up. And if you think about what happened in the Cold War, same thing. The Soviets were going to bury us and hit, hit counters with shoes and, and win the Cold War by doing top-down technology. And it turned out it didn't work very well. That's a prediction. I don't know if it's true or not. We are so much more powerful by ourselves than any other country in the world, and certainly the Russians. And we've cornered the market on all the interesting, fun, exciting allies they have. Okay? They're left with the dregs. Who really wants to be an ally with North Korea? That's like, you know, that's a short straw. <laughs> okay? Alright, so. We hold almost all the cards in the story when we're complaining that somebody has the four of aces. Right? Um, if that's the best they can pull out of the deck, let them have it. Time and oil prices are our biggest assets. If we can keep oil prices low, if you guys reduce your consumption of natural fossil fuels, you're fighting World War II. Okay, great. Well, uh, please join me in thanking this exceptional panel of moderators. You all were really fabulous. And, and I think, and, and I'm sure that you all feel this way, is you know, we don't have this opportunity when we're watching television. And even though I, I often like many of the people who come on the shows, and I think that they even have some disagreement from time to time, I think you really helped us out here today a great deal. And I want to thank you very, very much. Very quickly, um, I know there was a, a question earlier. I think I'm, what I want to say is I think it is in our interest, it is in the American interest, to finish this investigation. And when that happens, when that happens, we then have an opportunity to know and understand where we push back and where, in fact, there have been problems that none of us would have been able to foresee, and we can then act on those. The very, very best way to do that is, of course, in a bipartisan fashion, and that completion of the investigation is critical. The way we um, change 16 is we win an 18. <laughs> That is get people out, make sure your neighbors, associates, everybody with, um, votes. That's that's very very critical. And always ask what's in the American interest. Sometimes being in the American interest is talking to our enemies. That's what diplomacy is all about. We don't talk to our friends. We talk to our enemies. And that's why it's so important that we have a strong diplomatic corps, foreign service corps, and that we inspire young people today to go into that. And unfortunately, I do believe 
that this administration has ever done everything in their power to do just the opposite, I think. Um, that's a problem. I wanted to, to end with a quote because very important, we strengthen our values, that's how we strengthen democracy. It's a quote from Thomas Jefferson that I like, and uh, you all in mind. Just like Dr. should have said, the fact that you're here, the fact that you care, that you come out today, means a great deal. So in the, in the words of Thomas Jefferson, I know of no safe depository of the ultimate powers of the society, but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to ex exercise their control of wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion. Bye. Thank you all so much.